welcome everybody here this afternoon. So this is Harvey Cool. He's the Associate Agronomist for Bear Crop Science. And uh, he's going to talk today about the benefits of using wheat in uh, crop rotation. So. Not to correct people, but the one thing I will say is I'm with BASF. I've since been sold. I don't know. It's a big corporation, ag. I change the name on my paycheck from time to time. I just never notice. Uh, so I'm with BASF. I started with Bear Crop Sciences. I was there. Well, started with Mycogen, and then I was at Monsanto, and then I went to Bear, and now I'm at BASF. But so I've been at BASF for. I think three years. Basically, when they when Bear started buying Monsanto, we got sold. Well, we were back and forth, we're sold, then we were, then we were, then we were. <clears throat> Government regulations said that that's what it had to work. We went we went with somebody else. Um, so BASF picked us up. Hi. We do wheat and soybean breeding at the mile west of the Goner exit. You drive past. All the bright lights are ours. Can't miss the place, especially at night. Um, great big greenhouse, and like I said, it's right by the interstate. So I've been, I'll say, with this these last two companies eight years at that site for basically eight years now. Um, kind of in charge of the farm. We have 400 acres of, of land. The site kind of is in the middle of that 180, as you can see, that's our building site there, but we still have plots on both sides of it. And then basically each crop uses up another 80. So all, all the 80s are linear irrigated, there's a linear over there. Um, I guess I'll start this one off a little different than I did the last one. How many of you are wheat farmers and how many of you even know what wheat looks like? I'm not sure you know what it looks like, but. When I applied for this job, they were asking me, I, like I said, I've been with seed corn all my life. They said, what do you know about wheat? I said, well, I think you plant it in the fall, unless you're doing the other one, then you just plant it in the spring. And I said, it gets about this tall, turns gold when it's ready. I said, other than that, I, that's all I got. You know, you make, you make bread or beer out of it. I don't know. And so I've been learning a lot. <clears throat> Our four year rotation is commercial corn, which one of the neighbors does. Um, soybean nurseries, our soybean breeding program, and bulk soybeans go in 180. And then another 80 will be peas, German millet, and then we'll plant it to winter wheat that fall. And then we'll do, then therefore the winter wheat and then cover crop after that before going back through those same cycles again. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been around the peas or anything else. They come off about the same time, I want to say like mid-July, right around that July time frame. I think Jeff harvested them. Got, I don't know, 50-ish bushels to the acres that, you know, not, not a fantastic yield, but did great for what we wanted them to do. And I guess pretty good as far as peas go. Like I said, again, I'm not a pea farmer, so, <clears throat> we're in the middle of, of corn and seed corn country, so I don't know. We're learning. Everything that we're doing is a learning experience. Um, this is one of the few things I've kind of noticed is research is hard on ground. You know, we have everything from we do moldboard plowing to no-till on the same 80 and the same crop year. Uh, some crops get removed, some can't be removed. I have to either find a way to terminate them, bury them in, do something, hence the mold board plowing. It's not something, I'd say it's not something we love to do, but there's a few of us that love doing it, but don't really love doing it to the ground. Some covers can't be used because of chemicals that we've used on the other crops. And I'm trying to make the ground, I, for the breeders sakes, they want it as uniform as possible so that they know that each plot beat out the other plot because that's just a better variety, not because it was on a better spot of ground. <clears throat> and when I say plots, like I said, there'll be some pictures later, but on the wheat side, I'm gonna say there's probably somewhere between 30 to 50,000 different 
varieties out there. And they're, you know, they could all be it's what they call sister varieties. You know, they're, they're close, but they're not exactly the same. You know, some of them are anywhere from three foot long. Some of them are 15 foot long. Um, but that's kind of what we do. In the past, as you can see, we've had some challenges with wind because we had people that decided that really to make it uniform and to make it the best we can, you just keep working it and it'll, it'll get back to right. And we tried explaining that it will not get back to right. It will get back to dirt and it will blow. And it did. We lost crops. We, we lost a lot. So now a lot of my job is trying to turn things back into soil. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not an overnight process, but we're working on it. This is my cover crop mix. I got told the other, when we did this the first time, kind of playing with it. it it's, a, it's a very fluid recipe because you just never know what's gonna work and what's gonna work the best. This is what I found. There's two pages. Oats are, oats, spring barley, winter barley take up about 60%. You know, sorghum sedan grass, get some height on it. Rapeseed and turnips. Now, the one thing I will warn people on Rapeseed, from time to time, if you do anything with cover crops, you kind of got to watch out depending on what you're going to spray it with. Because if they run out of actual rapeseed, they will put in canola, which is a sister, basically, which is fine. They do the same thing in the field. But the problem is about 95 to 99% of canola is Roundup ready. So if you're only using Roundup to kill your cover crop, and you have canola out there, it doesn't care. <laughs> I went through it, but it is over. I mean, you know, depending on what you're going to put in there, if you're going to put in a corn, Callisto, any of them, just take care of it, and then it's not a problem. Um, buckwheat, camelina, mustard, vetches, clover, lentils, and then yellow peas. Uh, the, the covered crop that you'll be seeing pictures of here in a second, I work with the soybean sales program and stuff we had left over. I had a bunch of peas left over from planting spring crop. They don't carry over very well. So we took those and they had a bunch of soybeans that they said if we're, if I couldn't use them, they were gonna throw them away. I said, well, they're either throw them in a dumpster, we'll throw them in a planter and put them in the ground. So <clears throat> I had my regular cover crop, which was this, and then I added about 50 pounds of soybeans and peas to it as well. So. It was thick this year. Probably not gonna quite commit to that much again because it's a lot. The field that I was, that you seen the slide of earlier where it kind of blew out there and the wheat was barely standing. They decided that they couldn't do anything with it. There's probably 20 to 30 acres. And so in about May, we took off and we didn't, we'd sprayed it once. We had no idea what the chemical carryover was gonna be. So we just took off and planted a little bit across in a couple angles. Just see what had come up. It all came up. We went, well, we must not have much care, chemical carryover, so we're going to plant our cover crop. This is on July 28th. I was taking these pictures, and you can't see it real well down here, but there's a lot of moisture, and I hadn't watered. I hadn't done anything. It was kind of a wet year, but not not great. But um, so we went through it, and like I said, so I I work after the wheat. We, once they get done harvesting, everything's gone, then I'll work the ground, then I let the volunteers come up and then I have to spray them out because they don't want any of the wheat carrying over because it'll carry the diseases. So I worked all this because then I could plant the new cover crop into it. So I planted the entire 80 to cover crop through this and it worked fantastic and it came up about the same again. Uh, and then winter killed. <coughs> This is planting soybean, not really test plots, sales plots, I guess we'll call them, for our sales agronomist person. He put some plots out there on the site. We no-tilled it in. At first he wanted to till it, and I, I pushed pretty hard, and he said, well, if you think it'll work, we'll try it. He said, if it doesn't work, we can always work it. 
We made one pass and he said, just keep going, works great. So that's what we did. Um, this was in, this would have been not as thick as that other stuff, but it pretty close to the same. I mean, it's the same basic recipe. That's my cover crop after wheat. Now, like I told everybody else, depending on what you guys are doing, I don't know how many of you guys got cattle or do anything like that. That was planted, like I said, about a month after harvest. So I'm gonna say early August, early mid-August that was planted. Um, and that was after a very light freeze because the sedan grass is all dead. The sunflowers, they held on a long time. We had that early November. It got down to about 20 degrees or a little under at one night and it took my sunflowers out. I still got, I was gonna get a picture before I left. I still got a bunch of peas out there. They're still hanging on, they're struggling because 20 degrees, it's, it's trying to kill them, but it hasn't got there yet, but it's still pretty green. The neighbor was, when he went to plant the commercial corn, was real worried about it because I had sunflowers out there. I mean, I had everything else. He said, I, do I need to work it? I said, I just assume you didn't. I said, again, try it, run through it, see what it does. We'll make a couple rounds if it works, keep going. He texted me and he said, well, we made one pass, we're not gonna stop. So they just took off and went. An international planter, I mean, he does no-till, but it's just in the bean ground normally. He said, I changed nothing. There's an international 30 inch planter and he just took off and rolled and it went great. This year he's planting, we are, I planted about 20,000 or 2,000 acres of cover crop after the soybeans. As soon as he started harvesting beans, I was putting in cover crop behind him with his drill. And it's just a note, it's just a sunflower 40 foot drill. Nothing fancy about it. I'll show you a picture of ours. It's basically the same, except ours is 10 foot wide. Again, if you have any questions throughout this, let me know. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not a, I'm just a guy that apparently worked at a wheat farm, so knew what wheat was. So they put me up here. Um, so the, the German millet, like I said, we took the peas off. And then shortly after he was done, I sprayed it with Roundup just to kill any weeds that we had. We did have some mare's tail and stuff coming up through. So I took care of them with some Roundup. And then we planted the German millet about 45 days later, we were harvesting it. I was kind of hoping, I see one of the guys that harvested, cut it and baled it was, is at this training. I don't know where he's at. I was hoping to put him on the spot. See, but we got pretty good, he got a pretty good amount of feed off of it. And then like I said, so there, but there's some areas. So in this field, like right in here, this was regulated soybeans. And that's where I said, we, we mold board plow, we have to bury it. And then for the next year, they have to volunteer monitor it. So it couldn't have peas on it, so they could, because otherwise they couldn't find the soybeans in the pea field. It's too thick and trying to differentiate the two. So I couldn't put the peas on there. So we did oats and then millet on there, but then none of that can leave either because for our stewardship rules, if there would have been a soybean in there, it's just for the companies lawsuits and feed and everything else. Most, our regulated beans can go to feed, but it's just easier to not do it that we don't have a problem. If, if get in the wrong hands or get in the wrong spot. Um, I've been told stories of other companies that had to buy barge loads of either beans or rice or anything else because it had, they tested it, it had one GMO seed that wasn't listed for it. They paid millions and billions of dollars, bought it, drove it out into the ocean and dumped it off the side. So for the company's sake, they went, we're not gonna do that anymore if we don't have to, just destroy it. So that's what we did. Um, No-till fill, wheat and winter barley. We've been using, it's P919. I think it's a Nebraska, it's a UNL variety. It's been working fantastic for us, winter barley. Um, if you plant, mid-October and earlier it does great it seems like the later you get in October depending on mother nature in the year if it doesn't get up very good then you lose some of the winter kill otherwise it's been doing been doing really good uh, anymore I try and do one tillage pass at most 
like I said, if I can get them to do nothing, that's what I do. But with our little research planters, you know, I don't have much weight. I don't have much down pressure. I just can't, can't go through much. Well, they don't think they can go through much. They don't give as much credit as they deserve. Cause like I said, I went through standing brassicas and turnips and it sliced right through them and put them in. But it scares them. We work it a little bit. These, it's kind of hard to tell on this picture. Um, this is what I was talking about. This this is our regulated soybean trial. This is what we've plowed this year because they want the, the residue. We go out and they harvest what they want and then the rest of it gets ground. Our combine combines have grinders on them. We grind it, throw it away, and then we they want it buried. So that's why the plow works fantastic. Plus, like I said, it's kind of fun to go out and plow still every now and then, but it's the ground doesn't appreciate it. So we're working on, we're talking about either some if we, depending on when we can get in there, they're usually pretty late. I think this year we actually got done before Thanksgiving. Uh, so bean harvest was late. So we're looking at like some winter peas to try and get something else growing out there and help hold it. But again, you know, the, the spring peas down to about 20 degrees are still growing and they'll grow faster. Winter peas are pretty slow is what I've been told. So. We're trying, it's going to try some different things to try and get more trash there, but after corn, bean program wants to be after corn because that's just what normally happens. So we do, uh, I do one tillage pass just basically to knock the stocks down. And <clears throat> this is our, my no-till planted barley. That was taken the 24th of November. We planted it the 24th of September, two months later. It was actually doing really good. If you looked at the two, this year we did wherever was, we knew was going to be barley was not going to be wheat trials. We no-tilled it. Um, I, I only worked once where they were going to plant wheat. That's the wheat over there. It's not looking bad, but in my opinion, it's not looking near as good either. So, I mean, now the one thing you'll notice it's just because it's barley, it's not near as green. You know, the, the winter wheat is nice and green. It's looking, like I said, for, for what it is or for what it's doing, it's kind of hard hard to tell because they like said some of, a lot of that is, that's probably an inbred right there. It just doesn't have the virility that uh, the other programs would. That could be a, a first year, you know, it could have just came out of the greenhouse and it's in for a rude awakening. It went from greenhouse, perfect conditions, everything controlled fertilizer twice a week, everything at once to get thrown outside in the field and I gotta work for a living now. So, but that's what it's doing. Um, the nice thing about wheat in the rotation, like I said, it's financially, it's not there. I mean, I can't lie to you and say that it is. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, you know, but it makes decent money, it will, help you in the long run, just with the soil health. It will help you get some of them other nutrients. It fixes some other nutrients. And um, I think it was Jace from Green Cover. You know, the grasses actually do really well. You know, everybody thinks about like the radishes that put down the big roots in their cover crop, busting things up. Really, there's a lot of these grasses, rye especially, wheat, and oats will bust down through and they put in so many roots that they'll just, they'll eventually get busted through it. So they're busting up that hard pan, they're cleaning things up and they're doing this job. You spread out your harvest and planting day. Like I said, again, if you had cattle between the wheat and between, if you put a cover crop in behind it, um, I had one of the neighbors put in a half section of wheat and that was largely because I think he put in teff grass afterwards. He said, I needed something for the cows. I put that in and he said, then I put in another mix. And he said, the cows did fantastic. He said, everybody loved it. He said, yeah, the, it didn't make me as much money as the other half sector, you know, as my other ground. But in the long term, for cattle feed and for, for soil health, the money's there. Uh, this is one of our combines. Is that a little Every, winter stagger? Yep, the, winter stagger delta. My opinion. Really good research combine. Yeah, two I, rows, twenty feet at a time. Yep. Takes a long time. Depending on yeah where we're at in the field, like I said, we can be harvesting anything from three foot to twenty foot plots. Um, we've got planters. 
our, our plant, our plot planters were on five foot centers. They're planting three foot, anywhere from seven and a half inch. We've got a 10 inch and 15 inch rows. Um, you know, we're planting anything, like I said, from three foot long plots, micro plots to 20 foot long full plots. We've got one that's a space planter. I can turn it and change gears. I, I can do all kinds of silly things with them, but we can change gears on them and we can, we can space it out and put the seed anywhere from half an inch to, I think I can do up to 36 inches apart because sometimes they'll have to identify that that plant is crossed this mom and this dad, and it all has to be tissue sampled. We have to go out, cut little pieces off the leaves, freeze dry it, send it to Germany, they test it, they come back and say, yes, this will pass, no, it won't. And then we go from there. Uh, when I say our no-till drill, like I said, that's it. It's a 10-foot sunflower. There's no no-till coulters on it. it. It went from Kansas to Puerto Rico, sat over there for a few years, then it came back all the way to Nebraska and it's just what we use. It's not fancy by any means. Somebody in the other classes, they were asking about separation. If you're doing a multi-species cover crop, what I've been told and what I've seen is like this drill, uh, the front and the back, the tank, instead of the levels being at the same level, they're offset. And somehow that, when you're going through the field, doesn't let the seed bounce around and it feeds it out nice and even. And, uh, you know, I got scientists that worry about, because like I said, my cover crop is anything from sunflowers to, you know, the rapeseed and turnips are, I don't know, the size of a gnat and then, you know, the size of a fruit fly. Well, I can't, but it, going through the drill, it comes out nice and even. It all comes up. It looks really good. I've planted, I usually try and plant, I'd say around an inch, inch and a half. We plant it up to two inches deep. And everybody says them small seeds won't come up with the bigger seeds they just seem to come up i mean it takes them takes them a lot longer because you know you're a little tiny seed and you're trying to get it two inches out of the ground Hell, i don't know that's 20 30 times it's it's size so it takes it a while but it gets there and they'll catch right back up <clears throat> when jason did his pictures he was talking about vetch vetch overwinters really well he showed some pictures where it was like uh, 12 to 18 inches high but the vetch is, like you said, it's kind of deceiving because it's 12 to 18 inches high, but if you actually go pick that plant up, then it's all of a sudden almost as tall as you, you know. Puts on a lot of flowers, looks pretty, whatever, but it does a fantastic job. Which is that? What's that? Like a hairy vetch. Common oh. vetch and hairy vetch is in my all my cover crop mixes. But, um, and it's, I don't remember, you'd have to look, it's like 1%. But, you know, then when you actually see it out there, you say 1% and I'm planting, I plant the high rate. I think I plant like 25 pounds an acre. It cost me, cost the company about $30, $35 an acre. If you want to spend less, we just turn the drill down is all I do. But uh, at 1%, you'd think you'd never even see it out there, but it's all over. So, I mean, <clears throat> that, is, that is the end of what I've got. Um, like I said, I've been to several of these things. I've talked to a lot of people about cover crop, and it's always, it won't work for me, will work for everybody, maybe not. But if you're willing to try it and give it a chance, most of the people that I talk to that say it won't work, they tried it for a year, it didn't work that year, so I never did it again. You know, um, Jace brought up another good point. When I was at, Dr. Ward was given a, a speech once, and he said at his farm down in Saline County, wherever his farm's at, west, down by western Nebraska, I believe, you know, in the south corner of the state, uh, he said he had, he usually runs, uh, mine's like a, what, a 10 or 12 way mix there, and that's about what he's running. Sometimes he's running these wild mixes of like 20 different crops, but I haven't gotten people convinced to get quite that wild yet. But he said I, I put in plots of each different of each different plant, each different species. And then he said, then I had my last plot was the mix. And he said, it was a hot, dry year. And he said, all the single species were either dead or dying and didn't look very good at all. And the multi-species was green as a gourd and doing fantastic. They start to live off of each other. 
Again, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a college educated person. I don't know all the details of it, but when they're together, they're happy. When they're alone, they just get kind of cranky and don't, don't do very good. Like I said, um, we usually put it in. I've, I've tried doing after corn. If I can get in early enough, it works out okay. The biggest thing is it starts getting cold so quick, you know, I lose all the spring mixes. So <clears throat> unlike the last, the last couple times I've done it, there was some winter barley in there. It made it through. But when you got a cover crop that, you know, it's kind of like these chairs, about half of these scattered across the room looking out on the field. I don't know if it did much good, but it was out there. We made an effort. And like I said, for a few weeks, there was a lot of things growing out there and then they, they didn't make it. But now, like I said, my, now that I've learned, my peas are doing really good. You know, the sunflowers did good until, I'm gonna say in that mid twenties, once it got down to like that one night, it hit about 20 degrees for just a little bit. And then I came to work the next day and they were starting to, they didn't make it, but they were still doing good. And they were, you know, they were this high and flowering out when they died. They did everything I needed them to do, wanted them to do. I would have been fine if they'd have made it another month, but. That, but yes. Did you raise peas as a cash crop? Is that? Yes, we did. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, did you, how much were they, how much were peas worth? Did, could you figure making any money? I'm going to say they were, like I said, we just, Jeff harvested them all, he took them all. I mean, five foot combine, I'm not going out there and harvesting 100 acre peas. Yeah. <clears throat> but he took them all, took them to Hastings. And I believe that they pay about the same as soybeans. So they're, they're pretty close. The biggest thing we've, in, in our big one year of learning with peas, when they look ready, give them another week, two weeks, three weeks. So are they, they were, planted in the fall? We planted them early spring. Okay. And actually I wanted to plant them about two, three weeks earlier and I did. I'm gonna say we planted them probably, I think it was like early May. I wanted them to plant them like mid April could probably even after seeing what I've seen this winter could probably do early April but we had some planter problems he just bought the 40 foot drill it was not cooperating we had to do some work to it and then it rained so I didn't get them in as early as I wanted but um, you know they were they were brown and looked dead and then they were still pretty wet and about what time? this was, was early July early July. early July is when he harvested them so about mid-July is when I actually took them out. If we'd have planted them when I wanted, it probably would have been about the same as like winter wheat. Now, like I said, we're gonna play with some winter peas and see what they do, but I think for what we're doing, we're gonna stay with the spring peas. <clears throat> and then he'll take them out, like I said, and then put on that, put in the German millet right behind it. In about a month to a month and a half, that was heading out and needed to be bailed. That got bailed. Like I said, I don't know. I was hoping Mike was in here to let me know about what we got, but I think in the 10 acre patch they started on, I believe I counted 15 or 20 big round bales. So, I mean, it was, you know, and German millet, it, it gets about, it was about, I'm going to say mid thigh and then headed out. The, the peas, were, were they input costs with that? Was it fertilizer or herbicide? We did, I did do, right after plant, post planting, I sprayed Roundup and Prowl. And then that's all we did. I watered them. You know, when, when we thought we needed, what's that? We did not do any fertilizer. We did not do anything. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I think you could play with it some, but from talking Matt, my agronomist at Servitec, he said, I, you know, we did the soil samples. He said, the soybeans didn't need anything. He said, I don't really recommend anything. We could put something out there, but he said, I don't think it'll do much. So they, they scavenged their own in, they made in. I just let them go. I said, it's just a, it's a fill for us. So I didn't, you know, I told Jeff, I said, if you want to add some to it, you can do whatever you want, that's on you. But like I said, we did the Roundup and Prowl. I've seen some other guys that just did Roundup and let the peas try and hold the weeds back and it didn't. The Prowl H2O seemed to work pretty good. Not a, not a pun for the company, but it really is. I said the, it's our chemical and it did work pretty good. 
Yes. Do those peas nodulate pretty good? Or yes, they no? did. I said they, you know. Or were they or treated with the? Nope. Uh, they're oh treated or or treated. They're, inoculum you put yes, on. Yes. The, well, there was they came inoculated, pre-inoculated. Oh. All yeah. of our seed. Yeah. I'll go against Jace here. All of our seed comes out. Of, I I ordered all through. I have a guy in. He's down by Axtail or something. But anyway, he uh, that's where I get all my seed from. It comes out of arrow seed, out of Broken Bow. They treated it all. We just dumped it in the drill and went. I said, we know till The only complaint I had was I probably shouldn't. They didn't really appreciate that I no-tilled into my plowed ground. It's rough. I didn't <laughs> care, but they did. They yeah. bounced around, so... So they kind of complained about that. But no, the peas did fantastic. And then the millet came in and kind of, it took over some of the end that the peas left. I didn't put on any fertilizer with that. And then, like I said, then we put on wheat and I think we put on, well, we variable rated. There's a few other micros we put in, but mostly it was just a little bit of N. You know, <clears throat> we've got to watch the wheat because they've they found, you know that we do all the because what we're doing is trying to make it better for certain markets um, so they want certain protein levels i don't remember the numbers i think it's between 11 and 16 percent well they're putting on we put on too much in we were getting we couldn't get down to 16 percent, so we we're putting in way too much protein and then it doesn't work as good for <coughs> whatever they want to do they don't want to pay the extra money the wheat buyers the bread places if you're using it for feed and food it's fine but for certain things they want it between a certain range for bread for noodles right. I don't know. not a baker I don't know but they wanted 11 to 16 percent we were way too high because they were they were one how high was it I think we were running like around that 20 or something I mean not like oh. you know, blowing it clear out but it was it was too much nitrogen and it couldn't use it, and so the protein was too high. Mm -hmm.